multi-threading, multi-processing, potato, potato. Aren't they the same thing? Although they sound very similar, multi-threading and multi-processing are in fact very different. So what's the difference? Well, let's find out. Welcome to Doka.jl, where I explore the vast Julia wilderness and turn my discoveries into wholesome Julia tutorials. For today's tutorial, I will be using the Julia documentation on multiprocessing and distributed computing as a reference. Like multi-threading, multiprocessing is a form of parallel computing that can be performed on most modern computers. Multi-threading means running a single process across multiple threads. Multiprocessing means running multiple processes either on a single computer or across multiple computers. In order to get a better idea between a single process running in series compared to multiple processes running in parallel, let's take a look at a simple demonstration. I think the best way to introduce the subject of multiprocessing is to take you through a standard sales pitch for why you should use multiprocessing. Don't worry about typing in this code for now. All of my code is available in my GitHub repository. So here's the pitch. If one worker needs to repeat the same task 10 times, then it takes that worker 10 units of time to complete all of the tasks. Now, if you have 10 workers and they all perform that one task simultaneously, then it would only take one unit of time to complete all of the tasks. That's the idea behind parallel computing in general, and multiprocessing is a form of parallel computing. We can see a demonstration of this by using Julia. The Julia tools for multiprocessing can be found in the standard library named Distributed. Let's add 10 workers. The way to add workers is by using the addProx function from the distributed library. Now let's model the performance of one worker performing 10 tasks in series. A sleeve function is a placeholder for some unidentified task that takes one second to complete. The endProx function is from the distributed library and it returns the total number of processes available. More on this later. Let's run this code a couple more times and then record the time in a separate text file. So as you might expect, it took about 10 seconds for one worker to complete 10 tasks that take one second each. Now let's model 10 workers performing that same task, but doing the work in parallel. You can do that by using the at spawn at macro from the distributed library. The at sync macro is used here to ensure that Julia waits for all of the tasks to be completed before returning the time. Again, let's run this code a couple more times and then record the time. As you might expect, it took 10 workers only one second to complete all of the tasks since they performed the tasks simultaneously. So running our task in parallel was 10 times faster. So was this a good sales pitch? Are you now convinced that multiprocessing is the greatest thing ever? So why don't we use multiprocessing for all of our tasks? Hmm. Well, if you look closer at the info from the at time macro, you'll see that the memory allocation for the parallel process 
is roughly 10 times larger than the memory allocation for the single process. Keep that in mind when we take a look at the next example. We're going to repeat our little experiment, but instead of using the sleep function as a placeholder, we're going to replace it with hello world. Here is one worker repeating hello world 10 times. Again, let's run this a couple more times and then record the time. Now, here are 10 workers all saying hello world at the same time. Again, let's run this a couple more times and then record the time. Shockingly, running this code in parallel is actually slower than running this code in series. Also, note that the memory allocation for the parallel process is roughly 10 times larger than the process running in series, just like before. My expectation for multiprocessing was that multiprocessing was meant to make my code run faster. But in reality, sometimes it does, and sometimes it doesn't. Now that I've ruined my own sales pitch, Let's get into more detail about what multi-threading is versus what multi-processing is, so that we can get a better understanding of how to use these tools. Multi-threading and multi-processing are both forms of parallel computing. Multi-threading is parallel computing on a micro scale, while multi-processing is parallel computing on a macro scale. The motivation behind multi-threading is speed. The motivation behind multi-processing is flexibility and scalability. Multi-threading is for a single process that's split up into tiny pieces with shared memory, and then run through multiple threads simultaneously. As the name suggests, multi-processing is for multiple processes, each with its own memory and running independently and simultaneously. In multiprocessing, a process may be single-threaded or multi-threaded. In multiprocessing, processes may be run on a single computer or run on multiple computers connected by a network. When multiple processes are run on multiple computers connected by a network, that's known as distributed computing. In distributed computing, network computers may be located in the same room, or they may be scattered in different cities around the world. A special form of distributed computing is known as cluster computing. Historically, cluster computing meant a room full of consumer-grade computers that worked together in order to enhance computational power. Today, cluster computing generally refers to a cluster of computer hardware components like CPUs and GPUs that are assembled in climate-controlled cabinets and connected by network cables. A special form of cluster computing is known as high-performance computing, or HPC. Historically, HPC was referred to as supercomputing. HPC is located at the frontier of human knowledge, so if you're looking for a way to get there, congratulations. You just found it. Multiprocessing is a gateway that leads to that wilderness. So to recap, multiprocessing on a single computer, distributed computing, cluster computing, and HPC are all examples of multiprocessing. You'll be happy to learn that Julia supports all of these forms of multiprocessing. Although these are all fascinating subjects, I will only be covering the simplest form of multiprocessing, that being multiprocessing on a single computer. With that said, let's run through some basics for how to run multiple processes simultaneously on your computer.
In this section, I will be creating a cheat sheet by answering some basic how-to questions regarding multiprocessing in Julia. Multiprocessing is a very large subject, so I will not be able to cover all of the topics. So I encourage you to check out the Julia documentation on multiprocessing if you're hungry for more information. Before we get started, we need to set up our environment and load the plots package. Close your open files and then close out of your Julia session and start a new one. In the REPL, change your present working directory to the directory where you want to save your project environment. I'm using a folder named Tutorial 08 by 04, but feel free to choose your own project folder name. Enter the package manager, activate your directory, and then load the plots package. After the package has loaded, exit the package manager and create a new file. All of the multiprocessing tools are housed in the distributed standard library. For multiprocessing, Julia uses a master worker model. The master process is process 1. The first worker is process 2. The second worker is process 3, and so on. You can add workers by using the add prox function. Let's add five workers. You can see the number of active processes by using the nprox function. These six processes are like having six Julia REPLs open at once. Each process has its own memory, and each process is isolated from the other processes. You can see a list of the processes by using the prox function. In this vector, 1 is the master, and 2 through 6 are the workers. You can see a list of just the workers by using the workers function. You can also remove a worker by using the remove process function. This example will remove process number 6. You can remove any worker process, but you cannot remove the master process. You can call the same functions to view the processes and workers to see the updated information. I find it a little confusing that worker number one is process number two, and that worker number two is process number three. I can't tell you how many times that I made the mistake by assigning a task to process number two, thinking that it was worker number two. In order to help me keep track of the workers, I like to assign the vector containing a list of the workers to a variable, so I can just refer to a worker by using the appropriate index number from this vector. This way, I can refer to worker number one simply by using index number one, and worker number two using index number two, and so on. You may not have this problem, so this is, of course, completely optional. You can assign a task to a worker by using the at spawn at macro, followed by the worker, and then followed by the task. Be sure to use the at spawn at macro and not at spawn. In this case, we're assigning worker number one the task to generate a 3x4 matrix filled with random numbers. Notice that this did not return the matrix. Instead, it returned a data type called a future. A future is a promise that the worker will complete the given task at some undetermined time in the future. If you want to see the result of the task, you need to ask for it by using the fetch function. You can also assign a task to any available worker by using any rather than using a worker number. In this case, we're assigning any available worker 
the task of calculating the sum of the numbers from 1 to 100. Your operating system will determine which worker is assigned the task. You can combine at spawn at and fetch as a way of sharing memory between workers, as seen in this example. Since each worker is like a separate instance of a Julia REPL, all of the workers have access to Julia Base, but they do not have access to the standard libraries. If you want a worker to use a Julia standard library, then you need to give them access to it. You can give all of the processes access to a standard library by using the at everywhere macro. In this example, we're giving all processes access to the statistics library and then assigning worker number four the task of calculating the mean value of 100 random numbers. If you prefer, you can grant access to the shared library to a specific worker by including the worker's process ID along with the at everywhere macro. In this example, we're granting worker number one access to the linear algebra standard library, but no other worker will have access to it. As you can see, when worker number two tries to call the axbbang function, it returns an error message since we didn't grant worker number two permission to use the linear algebra library. Another way to share memory between processes is by using a shared array from the shared arrays standard library. A shared array is just what the name states. This array is shared with all of the processes so any worker can access it. You can also grant workers access to external packages. But before you do that, you need to activate the project environment in all the processes by using pkg.activate. In this example, we're going to assign worker number three the task of plotting the data in the shared array. Pretty cool, right? Finally, let's take a look at how to use a module. When using multiprocessing, you'll probably want to create a custom module containing any functions you want to run. Let's create a toy module containing a hello world function. Be sure to save your module file in the same directory as your project. Be sure to save your file. Back in the cheat sheet file, let's grant access to our custom module to all of the processes, and then assign worker number four the task of calling our custom function. In order to call a function from your module, you need to include the module name, followed by a dot, and then your function name. I know that's a lot to take in, but now you have a handy multiprocessing cheat sheet. If you didn't catch all that, don't worry. You can find all of my code in my GitHub repository. There's a link to it in the description below. In order to reinforce what we just covered, let's work on a little multiprocessing project. For this demonstration, we're going to grab bits and pieces from the cheat sheet that we just created in order to show how flexible and how scalable multiprocessing can be. This demonstration is not meant to be a model of efficiency. In fact, it's pretty slow, and it actually runs faster in series. But hopefully, this demo will give you some ideas about how the different pieces can be put together. Start by closing out of your Julia session and by closing any open files. Launch a new Julia session and change the working directory to your project directory, and then activate it using the package manager. 
Now let's create a new module file named myfunctions.jl that will contain some tasks that we want to run in parallel using multiprocessing. Be sure to create your module file in your project directory. These task functions will take data as an argument and then use that data to perform different calculations with it. Finally, let's add a message so we can see when our module has been loaded onto the workers. And that's it. Be sure to save this file. Now let's create a new file that will manage all of these tasks. For now, let's just type in the code. We'll execute the entire file after we finish writing our code. Let's start by adding four workers. Now let's generate some random data to use. A shared matrix is just an alias for a shared array. Next, let's load our custom module that we just created. Let's also grant all workers access to the plots package. Then let's assign tasks to workers. Workers number one, two, and three will evaluate functions from our custom module. While worker number four will plot some of the data from the shared matrix. Finally, let's fetch the results of the tasks. And that's it. I'm going to dock the REPL next to my editor so I can see what's going on. You can execute the entire file by using Alt-Enter. You can view the results by evaluating the fetch functions again. Pretty cool, right? Hopefully, this demonstration shows you that multiprocessing is nothing like multithreading. You can use multiprocessing in many different ways, and if necessary, you can use it to scale up your projects to a global scale. In theory, you can launch hundreds of processes across hundreds of computers located anywhere in the world. These processes can be related, or they can be separate, like in our demonstration. Multiprocessing provides you with the building blocks to help you construct very large, very complex projects. The thing to keep in mind is that launching a new process takes a lot of overhead, since each process maintains its own memory. Because of this, it may not be worth it for smaller projects. But once you reach a point where one computer is no longer sufficient to keep up with your needs, that's the time to revisit multiprocessing. Multiprocessing also serves as a gateway to high performance computing. So even if you don't need it now for your smaller projects, learning how to use multiprocessing provides you with a solid foundation for what may lie ahead on your path to discovery. If you made it this far, congratulations! <laughs> if you enjoyed this video, and you feel like you learned something new, then please consider smashing that like button, leaving a comment, 
sharing this video, and subscribing to this channel. If you'd like to support the educational work that I'm doing, then please consider using the Super Thanks button. For ongoing support, please consider joining and becoming a channel member. Channel members get ad-free early access to all of my new videos. Thanks for watching, and good luck on your Julia journey.